last speaker who is awesome, Joe McDonald, who's come all the way from what Newcastle? From Newcastle, yes. Brilliant. And Joe and I are very good friends. He he um he funds my bank account, as you'll figure out later. Yeah. How he does that. Um, and he's going to talk about engaging the public. Now, thank you so much for staying to the end. Um, don't disappear after Joe's um, presentation because we just have a last sort of few minutes wrap up. Um, and now over to Joe for talking about engaging the public in information sharing gateways. Thank you. I am on the four o'clock to Newcastle. This will finish promptly at 3.30. <laughs> um, little bit, you, uh, where's Aid? Is Aid gone? Has he? All oh, right, well, that's a shame. That's a shame, actually, because I know he knows the answer to this question. Um, <clears throat> this chap here. No, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's Charles Hesterman Mertz. Does anybody know who Charles Hesterman Mertz is? Excellent. He, uh, he, he invented interoperability in Newcastle uh, at the turn of the century because he, he was the father of the national grid. Uh, and he decided that actually electricity wouldn't work unless we had a standard voltage, and he suggested 240 volts, and a standard uh, frequency, which he suggested 50 hertz. Now, it took, it took an act of parliament to make that standard stick. So, but it did mean that all the, all the electrical gadgets in, in the UK and much of the empire uh, could then interoperate. So why is interoperability important? Um, I missed out actually on the Royal College of GPs bit last night, which I gather had everybody in tears. Um, and I missed out because I got a phone call from a friend that I'd made at university and he rang me to tell me that his daughter was having a psychotic breakdown and he wanted my advice about what was the best antipsychotic medication for his daughter to start on her first episode of psychosis. And I had to explain to him, rather shamefaced, psychiatrist for 30 years, that I didn't know, I didn't know the best treatment for his daughter. Because when you start somebody on an antipsychotic, it's a lucky dip. You choose by lucky dip. You don't know which one's going to be right for that particular patient. So I might put his daughter on something which won't make her better, but it will make her fat. And she'll then want to stop taking it. And then she'll get worse. Uh, and instead of doing her GCSEs and going to university, she'll in fact end up in an inpatient facility. And that's all because I don't know which is the best antipsychotic for her. Now, I'm pretty sure it's encoded somewhere on her genome which antipsychotic will be absolutely right for her, in which case, and when I do get lucky, she's well in six weeks, she sits her GCSEs, she does her A-levels, and she goes to medical school, and it all goes in a completely different direction. But I don't know the best treatment for psychosis because I cannot make the data in the genome talk to the data about treatment and outcomes. So. That's how important interoperability is. It allows you to find the best treatment for psychosis. It allows you to cure schizophrenia, but we have failed to join up all of this lovely data, much of it already in electronic systems. Because I work in mental health, I get annoyed about paperless 2020 actually, because we've been paperless for five years. I've been wireless and mobile for three. So paperless 2020, that's just annoying. Um, but we need to make this data flow. So um, got a little bit lucky with um, my locality. Uh, being up north, um, just before the last general election, George Osborne, remember him? Started talking about the Northern Powerhouse. What's the Northern Powerhouse, George? Oh, better come up with an idea. All right, the Northern Powerhouse is going to be a scientific revolution in the north of England, and I'm going to give them £200 million to spend just on health IT, and it'll make, it'll make the north great again. Ooh. Um, after the election, 200 million turns into 20 million, because that's what happens after elections. But in the northeast, we got, we got um, 4 million uh, and to work for a program called Connected Health Cities, which was pretty vague, actually, in terms of what, it, what they were going to do. But you had to do something with health IT, and you had to make data flow, and you had, to, you had to make a difference. So we decided that we would do a number of care pathway projects, as we were instructed, but we would also try and do something of a large regional interoperability project. So this is about the practicality of doing an interoperability project rather than the theory. We've heard lots of the theory and 
yesterday I felt like I had a, an education which I wished I'd had 10 years ago actually um, and it's been really useful but this is more about the practicalities and the the engagement piece that you have to do with your clinicians and with your citizens uh, across a big patch the um, the lava lamp invented in Dorset uh, who also have a shared care record program um, the NHS you may have noticed operates on the lava lamp principle so big blob in the bottom when you get your lava lamp you turn the light bulb on and the heat causes it to break up into smaller blobs which go up to the top and then come back down to the bottom and go into a big blob again so that's how the NHS organizes itself so if you're going to do a big information sharing project you must be bigger than the biggest blob in the organization of the NHS so we picked a big footprint um, otherwise you get caught up in the in the blobbiness in the continuous organizational churn so you have to rise above that if you're going to do a good interoperability project so we went big we've got 3.6 million citizens nearly two and a half, well two, they're getting over 3,000 GPs two and a half STPs sustainability and transformation plans not everybody knows that one EHSN, nine acute trusts, three mental health trusts, seven local authorities. So we're going to do quite a big project. And this is the interoperability challenge that we face in the northeast. That's not all the systems that are at play in the northeast. So, um, and all of them, each one of these system suppliers, would like to be the one that gives me the solution, but all of the others don't want that. So it's really difficult to get all of these people to play nice in an integrated way. Other challenges, big clinical change. This is Dr. Eastwood. He's an old age psychiatrist. He works in Sunderland. <laughs> and he's not all that keen on the new electronic patient record that he's had. Uh, so you've got to get, I mean, Bob Wachter talks about business change. And I think that's, that's very important. There's been a bit of bother about information governance, um, care.data, all of that stuff makes life a bit difficult. Uh, and if you're trying to do a big information sharing project, especially for secondary use for research, then you're going you're gonna to run into some of these people who are going to make life difficult for you, or you think they might. The attitude that we've taken is, OK, some people are really passionate about privacy. And actually, it's just as well that we've got them because they did betray, they, they, they shone a light on some really quite appalling information sharing that was going on in the information centre days. Uh, and these people actually, if you're running a big information sharing project, they're your friends. They're the people who are going to tell you whether you're getting it right or not. These are the people that you need to consult with to make sure that you've got your IG right and that you're not upsetting anybody. 98% of people don't care. It's the 2% that you have to look after because they're the ones who will stop your information sharing project. So they're the people who really need to guide your thinking about consent and sharing. So, Great North Care Record. 12 months ago, Great North Care Record, a four word phrase in a pub around the back of St. James's Park. That's all it was, just an idea, just a phrase. Carefully chosen phrase, it's really vague. There's no geography in there and there's no word health in there because Michael is not a patient all the time, he's a citizen and he crosses from care, he goes to care, he goes to health, he goes everywhere. So pretty much that was the whole idea in the pub a year ago, best place in the world to get care, best place in the world to do research because one of the things that Connected Health Cities want us to do is to deliver good research. I've also got to bring jobs to the North East and try to persuade big farmer that they can replace shipbuilding in the northeast and coal mining and all the rest okay so yesterday we learned how to do interoperability in a day we all became experts um, which was great you're all going to be psychiatrists at the end of the next two minutes these are the stages of life that a psychologist called Eric Erickson says that we must all pass through the first and most important phase of development is in your first year and you must pass through a test called trust versus mistrust. And you, if you pass through this, you can move on to your next um, 
psychosocial crisis, as Ericsson called them. Move on to the next one, and eventually you get to be a proper grown-up. Um, and you get to be old with integrity. You get to be, you know, somebody who can get married and stay married and all that, all that good stuff. But it all starts with trust. So if you have a terrible first year of your life, you're in a, a dreadful orphanage and you're 18 cots from the only nurse on duty, then you will not develop basic trust. And if you don't develop basic trust, you can't achieve anything. Your life will be um, blighted. You can't pass through any of your other developmental challenges. So everything begins with trust. So how do you get trust from 3.6 million people, 2,500 GPs? How do you do that? You need game-changing clinical engagement and you need game-changing citizen engagement. And so much of what we're doing within the Great North Care Record is along those two lines. Now, let's talk about clinical engagement first. You're going to need all the staff on board. Let's say, I, I don't know, is it 30,000 staff in North East and North Cumbria? You, can, you can't do it overnight. So step one, spend years building regional interoperability community, which we did, and we did that long before anybody talks about Great North. Well, step two, spend years building a regional interoperability community. You've got to build that community if you're going to get anywhere. Get your funding where you can. Pick winners. So we've took funding out of Connecting for Health in those days. The Health Authority funded us for a bit. Um, E-Health Insider funded the Northeast uh, Clinical Health Informatics Network for a while. And latterly, Connected Health Cities are funding it. In that process, you get to know people. You meet people who are good and who can help you and who can get things done. And you need to keep them close and build that team. In terms of how you then engage with people, this is the office at Connected Health City. It's a Great North Care Records office. This is the wall of love. Uh, and actually, we borrowed the wall of love from a conversation I had with Andy Kinnear. Andy. This is not the same as what you described, but what I've got here on the wall, it's, it's all post-its. These are trusts. All of these are trusts. And these are important people. The CIO, CCIO, chief executives, IG leads, and all of their names. And all of these people need to love the Great North Care Record. We'll have to sleep with all these people. <laughs> all the members of the team trying to get around all these people. And some of them, there's not even anybody to sleep with. Sleep with them on your own, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so here you've got all the CCGs. Here's all the universities. So you have to engage with all these key stakeholders to make the Great North Care Record work. So that's quite, the, quite an engagement task. But you can get systematic about how you engage with these people. And these people change all the time, which is why they're post-its, not a spreadsheet, because you can just change them in and out. And you can also see at a glance who's missing and who needs to be brought in. But again, one of the things we, we did initially was we toured around. We went to Bristol, we went to Southampton, uh, we had a look at Northern Ireland, Liverpool, tried to take the best of everything that was there, and they gave very kindly. So if you look at the Great North Care Record vision, and you replace the word Bristol with the North East and North Cumbria, you'll see a remarkable similarity between the vision for Connecticut Care Bristol and Great North Care Record. So you've got to... You've got to touch a lot of people. It's really hard work. Uh, we talk about team of teams, so um, all the chief executives had to be got in a room and persuaded that this was the right thing to do. Crucially, all the IG leads got to get in the room and all agree about doing a quite a big, scary information sharing, information governance project. A um, couple of last... the uh, the really important bits of homework for you actually because I don't have time to talk about some of this stuff but there's a paper called Leading Clever People by Rob Goffey everybody gets these slides that are right at the end right yeah okay and video so you need to you need to go away and you need to read Rob Goffey's paper on Leading Clever People because all the people you're dealing with in this space are clever and they don't really want to be led actually uh, and sometimes uh, you get it terribly wrong if you think you can direct them you can't you can give them the problem and they'll bring you back the solution, but you cannot tell them what to do. So there are some principles about leading clever people that must be applied in this space. 
Connect Health City is trying to do three things in three phases in three years. Firstly, deliver better information for direct care, delivering the patient's important information to the point of care when it's needed. Secondly, better commissioning information. And thirdly, proper research. Everybody's on about big data, big data this, big data that. I'm not convinced. I'm interested in ICL data. Your genome, identifiable. I want to ring you up. You've got an interesting genome and we want to talk to you about this. That's where the cure for schizophrenia is. It's not in the big data. It's in proper research and it's being able to contact people and say, would you like to be in this study? And having their consent so to do. So we, we, we locked ourselves away for a long time and talked about um, how would we get consent for the, this level of research for identifiable data, the holy grail. And we want to produce this consent rich research environment where we've got lots and lots of consent and produce the most research friendly environment in the country. <coughs> so that's the plan. That's the strategy on a, on a single, single page. So what we need to do is establish information sharing in a part of the region, spread it out quickly. But whenever you're making a, a, um, a big interop project like this, uh, you've got to remember the three U's. It's got to be useful, it's got to be usable, and it's got to be used. If it's not used, it's no good. Oh, where is he? Every time I use this slide, I have to give Amir a tenor because it's his much. slide. Thank you very much. <laughs> <coughs> Many of you will have seen it before. It's the, it's the Hampshire Health Record. You can see it had lots of useful information in it. Useful, but not used for five years. Really, nobody looking at it. They turn on a single sign-on, suddenly it's usable and it's used. So useful, usable and used, that's what you've got to do. So we looked around at what was going on around the country and we decided that what we would do is MIG, Medical Interoperability Gateway. Everybody seen the MIG? Anybody, hands up if you haven't. A few, okay. What it is, this is, this is a patient record. This is what I see when I go to work in the morning, I open the patient record. And what my IT team have given me is a connection to the MIG. This says view primary care record. I click on there, brings up this consent screen. And just for the record, we already collect the patient's attitude to consent in my organization. You can consent everybody. And, and, and we do. So it brings up that consent screen. The, otherwise, the consent model is yes, no, break glass. View the GP record. You're in the GP record. Clinician sees that. So the secondary care clinician sees this, and he says a two-word phrase. It's always the same phrase. Starts with F, the first word, and the second word is me, because they can't believe that they've been practicing blind to the GP record all these years. They haven't ever realized that they're, they're how much information is sitting here. Loads and loads of information. Far more than summary care record. Sorry, summary care record, guys, but this is much more information. And you can drill down into individual items, who, what, where, when, and secondary care doctors like it. They talk about it. They go to the pub and they tell the GPs to turn it on because that's what they want. They want to see all of that lovely information. Next piece of homework. There's a YouTube video here. I don't have time to show it you. But there's a guy called Tom Loosemore. Anybody know Tom Loosemore? Couple, yeah. Tom Loosemore talks about doing the hard work in IT to make things simple for the customer, citizen, patient. So we have to do the hard work. That's us. We have to do the hard work so that when the patient goes to set their privacy settings or give consent, it's really easy. But what Tom Loosemore explains in that video is that IT makes it possible to do really complicated, infinitely complicated, and it's really simple on the top, so the citizen can do, make choices, make informed choices, uh, and uh, be able to set their preferences. To support NTW interoperability work and gain sign-off for information what? sharing. We well, haven't got time for that. 
That was a demonstration of the information sharing gateway, which the brilliant people in Cumbria produced, uh, not least probably because they put their IT budget in the hands of a clinician rather than the manager. Um, but you must watch that video as well. That's also embedded. And it's really important to look at the information sharing uh, gateway because that allows you to do uh, information sharing agreements at scale and pace. So we've got all of our, 96% of our GPs now have signed up to share that view uh, of the MIG into secondary care. So what it does is, what you, it's like joining a club. You join, you get a username, you get a password, and you go in as NTW's Caldicott Guardian. I go in uh, and I see all the local organisations I want to share information with, and, and I just click on the radio buttons choose my circle of trust. Newcastle hospitals, yes. Sunderland, yes. Middlesbrough, yes. All these GPs, yes, 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 yes. Simple as that. Doing the hard work to make it simple. And all the GP has to do at his end is one button. Information shared. Got to engage, got to communicate, got to do lots and lots of communication. Get a website, get FAQs, get a telephone helpline. Um, Get your people who are passionate about privacy. Do not call them tinfoil hat wearers. Remember, we owe these people a debt because they saved us from terrible information sharing in the past. They are the canaries in the mine and we have to look after them. But get them on your side. Get them to, get them to kick your project to death. So you have to do all of that communication. Get your brand out there. Get, develop a trusted brand. When you're asking people to trust you or to communicate or to share something or to consent, consent for what with whom? So you have to build a trusted brand, and we're trying to do that. You're on GP waiting screens, you have to develop uh, lots of information, uh, leaflets, and, be, and leave them everywhere, make sure that you communicate with everybody. We couldn't write to everybody, I didn't have the budget. So we wrote to the 2%. We wrote to the people who were um, objecting to summary care record, national sharing, uh, and secondary use. Uh, and some of them opted back in because they got it. This is about me. It's about local. It's about me. It's not the government. It's Great North Care Record, trusted brand. So it's spread. They're all practices that are currently on the MIG. Is it used? Yes, it is. These are three different organisations. And you can see what's happening with the usage of the MIG. I think we had an outage here. Um, but generally, the trend is that that's 20,000 clicks a month in that one trust. So it is used. That was easy, wasn't it? Well, because we've given explicit consent, we've used an explicit consent model, it was quite easy. Um, but the next trick bit is to do the secondary care piece. And to do the secondary care piece, we need a consent model that works. And we need a consent service so that a citizen can, can actually um, record their consent. And when we did this, run this past citizens, we've done a lot of that, when you run it past citizens, they say, um, yeah, OK, four or five levels, maybe corresponding to Will Smart's five levels. That seems to be a model that could work. But they also say, ah, while I'm there, can I record my uh, preferences around communication? Because I don't want to get uh, letters anymore. I've got email, I've got a smartphone. So I want to record my uh, preferences around communication as well. Oh, and um, my kidney donor status. And I don't want to go to more than one website. I want to do this once in one place. Um, oh, and you can have me genome. Oh, and you can have me pathology specimens as well. I'm a platinum level data donor for the Great North Care Record. I want to give it everything, all to you. So that's where we want to get to. We're not there yet. So we need that consent model. We need that consent service. And actually, we need to stop talking about consent because it's the wrong language. In every other organisation, um, if you want to join anything now, you get a username and a password and an account, and the thing they ask you to do after that is to set your privacy settings. Now, here we are in Google. Google Plus, their model, not shared. Shared with my family, shared with my family and friends, shared with friends of my family and friends, shared with everybody. Um, doing the hard work to make it simple. Tom Loosemore. So all of that good stuff needs to happen. And the conversation with the citizen goes like this. 
I've put your important shit in the back of the ambulance. We want something back. We want your data, and when we get your data, we're going to cure cancer, and we're going to find the best treatment for schizophrenia. And I won't have to look my friend in the eye in the pub and say, I don't know. That's the plan. Imagine if you were setting up the NHS now. Would you need a username and a password? I think so. Would you be expecting to set your privacy settings? I think you would. Can we afford to do this? <coughs> 79 million pounds every year in the NHS, just in England on stamps. In the Northeast, six million pounds every year on second class stamps. I can deliver the Great North Care Record for six million pounds a year. So they tell me. Thank you. I'm keeping I'm keeping my tenor.